think so. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the April Conservative Women's Network. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women, and we're delighted to host CWN here in our uh, Northern Virginia headquarters. Thank you all for coming today. Special thank you to the Heritage Foundation, our co-host Bridget Wagner, who is the Heritage Foundation's Vice President for Policy Promotion, and we're so happy you could come today and see our headquarters and be with us. She's been a great friend of Luce and Sue for many, many years, the Luce Center, and uh, she was even in our Great American Conservative Women calendar once. Oh, <laughs> well, how does one do that? We have, uh, <laughs> we have partnered with Heritage for 22 years now on the Conservative Women's Network uh, with a couple of months uh, for uh, COVID, yeah. Um, but it's a wonderful partnership. We love doing this. Um, and I want to announce that our next Conservative Women's Network will be on Friday, May 13th, and we'll send you all an email notice. And we're going to move back to the Heritage Foundation. They have a brand new room renovated, the Davis Room, um, and we're going to host Diana Frischgott Roth on the topic, Making American Energy Great Again. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. I, was in, I have to tell you, I was in Florida last week at an event. Uh, President Trump spoke, and he said, we need to make America great again, again. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're delighted to hear from Olivia Inos, a senior policy analyst in the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation, where she covers human rights challenges in Asia. She's been a regular columnist with Forbes and has traveled widely to speak and she's had articles published in all the most widely read publications. In 2014, she founded the Council on Asian Affairs, a group for young Asian policy professionals in Washington, D.C. She graduated with a B.A. in government in 2012 from Patrick Henry College and a master's degree in Asian studies from Georgetown University. She was a great debater in high school and in college. For, for hobbies, she likes Bar classes, you know, the, the bar, <laughs> good exercise. It's like ballet. <laughs> like ballet, yes. Oh, wow. And that's why she looks so wonderful. <laughs> and she's a great reader. She's married for 10 years, and she has two Boston Terriers. Please join me now in welcoming to the Conservative Women's Network, Olivia Enos. <laughs> It's a delight to be here today, and thank you so much to the Conservative Women's Network and also to the Claire Booth Luce Center for hosting me here today. It's, it's truly a delight. Um, I've been asked today to speak about combating authoritarianism in China, and I think China is an issue that is top of mind for just a lot of people all across the globe. And I think there's no better place to start than with a story. I want to tell you the story of Tersen Isaiah Wooden. Um, she's a Uyghur woman who was forced into the camps inside of Xinjiang, China. Um, she talked with the BBC, and she described what it was like to be a survivor of the Chinese Communist Party's brutality. While she was in the camps, she was subject to rape and various forms of sexual violence, and she described her experience there, saying, you can't tell anyone what happened. You can only lie down quietly. It is designed to destroy everyone's spirit. This is the great lengths that the Chinese Communist Party is going to, not only to subjugate the Uyghur people, but to truly oppress the Chinese citizens generally. Xi Wooden is but one of the between 1.8 million to 3 million Uyghurs that are currently held in political re-education camps today. She experienced firsthand what the U.S. government describes as genocide and crimes against humanity. Not just something that occurred in the past, but something that's actually occurring right now as we speak. I think the case of China demonstrates how blurred the lines are between issues of national security concern and of human rights concern. In fact, perhaps there is no clearer example in modern times of how these particular issues overlap with one another. And I think that this makes it even stronger the case that governments, 
we need to be focusing on not only advancing our own national interests, not only safeguarding our own national security, but also in defending and preserving human rights and liberty wherever they are under threat. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. I want to go into great detail about some of the very specific ways that China is persecuting individuals. I want to look at why China is doing what they're doing today. And then I want to talk about some possible solutions and things that not just the U.S. government can do, but that we as individuals can do in order to help um, to combat China as they continue to rise and as their authoritarianism continues as a threat. First, um, I want to cover the severity of the human rights challenges inside of China. So I, I briefly covered the situation that Uyghurs face, um, but I want to go into a little bit more detail. On the last day that the Trump administration was in office, uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said there is ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity happening against Uyghurs. And that determination was hugely important, not only because it was something the Trump administration said and made clear was a determination of the U.S. government, but because that has actually been upheld by the following government. And now we've seen follow-on action to respond to the severity of those crimes. But the basis of that determination was honestly quite terrifying. If you look at what people inside of those political re-education camps face, we know that they are subject to torture, forced indoctrination, that they are required to um, forsake their native language and to instead learn Mandarin, that while they're inside the camps, women like Zia Wooden are subject to various forms of rape and to sexual violence. We also know that people inside of the camps and outside of the camps are subject to various forms of forced labor and that the situation there is very severe. Just this past week, even, I have personally Uyghur friends who have received reports of family members back in Xinjiang that have passed away. People are dying inside of these camps. People are dying outside of these camps. But I think perhaps one of the most harrowing findings, and, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in some later points, is the fact that in order to make a determination of genocide, the U.S. government had to say that the Chinese Communist Party had the intent to destroy in whole or in part a specific group. And that intent, I think, is most clearly elucidated by the fact that the Chinese Communist Party, according to Adrian Zenz, a fabulous researcher at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, found Chinese Communist Party documents that said that they had a stated goal of forcibly sterilizing between 80 to 90 percent of Uyghur women of childbearing age. 80 to 90 percent. If the CCP is in fact successful in carrying that out, that means that the next generation of Uyghurs will either be substantially smaller, if not ultimately non-existent. I think that's where you find sort of this basis for genocide and crimes against humanity. The evidence is honestly incredible. But Uyghurs aren't the only ones facing persecution in China. We know that there has been long-standing persecution of Christians inside of China. Um, in fact, uh, my intern this past week, um, she, she wrote a piece that was on Pastor Wang Yi, who has been detained in China since, I think it was uh, December of 2019. And his crimes were being the pastor of a church um, and standing up, standing on the side of religious liberty and standing up for the religious beliefs that he held. He put out a fantastic uh, manifesto talking about the importance of re religious freedom and he led Early Rain Covenant Church, and many people inside of Early Rain Covenant Church have been called in for questioning by the Chinese police. They face persecution. His wife is under house arrest. He's just one example of somebody who's being persecuted for their faith. But we see all throughout China crosses being removed from churches, churches being shuttered, congregants um, being taken in for questioning. And even during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there was an individual who had sent out through WeChat, which is the Chinese version of um, instant messaging or, or texting. Um, it's, a, it's an application. He sent out a request for prayer and for fasting when the COVID-19 pandemic first started. And on the basis of having sent those messages, he was called into a police station and he was told that he was being detained for so-called unauthorized prayers. Unauthorized prayers. 
This is people practicing their most closely held beliefs in the ways that they believe are true in a way that shouldn't, should be considered non-threatening to any government. And yet the Chinese Communist Party sees those prayers as fundamentally threatening to their power. I think this is really terrifying. Um, Christians are not the only group either that are targeted. Of course, we've covered Uyghurs, we've covered Christians. There are also Tibetan Buddhists that have faced longstanding persecution in China. Um, like Uyghurs, um, many Tibetans are forced to forsake their language and their cultural practices. Um, many of them are forcibly removed from their homes and collectivized and sent elsewhere. Um, I mentioned Adrian Zenz earlier in our conversation, but Adrian Zenz actually documented that some of the same type of forced labor practices that we see in Xinjiang, which I'll go into greater detail about a little bit later, um, that those are actually happening in Tibet too. Um, and I think there's an intentional desire to remove people from place in very systematic ways. And it, again, demonstrates the dangers of a government that thinks that they can meddle in some of the most closely held beliefs. Um, so Tibetans continue to face severe persecution. Of course, I'm sure many of you have heard about um, the self-immolations that occur that people un often undertake in protest, a, a really extreme form of protesting. But this, I think, demonstrates the severity of the persecution that they've faced. I think, you know, I've covered all religious groups. Of course, there are non-religious persons who also face persecution, um, human rights lawyers, uh, citizen journalists, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic when people were reporting on what was happening in Wuhan, China. They faced severe persecution. There are several citizen journalists that have been disappeared where we, you know, they may be dead. They may be held in, um, you know, severe forms of detention. We honestly don't know. Um, but. It does not matter whether you're religious or not. If you are viewed as potentially threatening to the Chinese Communist Party, you are worthy of being targeted. But I do want to dwell on why specifically China has targeted persons of faith, because I think this is important, and it's actually very explicitly stated in Chinese Communist Party documents. Um, back in February 2018, the CCP introduced new regulations on religious affairs where they essentially defined all forms of religious practice as extremist under a policy called sinicization. And the purpose of the policy of sinicization is to make all religious practice conform to the Chinese Communist Party's goals and ends. In other words, you can practice your religion, but only so long as it advances what the CCP wants. And it's not really possible to practice your most closely held beliefs and still be in alignment with a Marxist-Leninist um, Chinese Communist Party um, that is very clear about their animosity toward religion. But in identifying all forms of religion as extremist, then they don't have to take anything off the table in terms of what they can do to severely persecute people. And I think that this goes even a step further. I mean, I think, you know, there's a reason why the U.S. government promotes religious freedom. It's because religious freedom is so closely tied to all other forms of, of freedom, I would argue, um, in very unique ways. But I think the Chinese Communist Party recognizes that if you can affect somebody's most closely held reliefs and even just adjust them ever so slightly, then your allegiance slowly but surely chips away towards that religious practice and instead is recentered on the government, which is where you would then sort of orient your life around things. And the CCP has taken it even one step further. And I think that is most clearly seen in the way that China targets the family specifically. Um, I have a wonderful friend. She actually lives not too far from here. She's Uyghur American. Um, and she and her husband and her daughter, they live here. Um, but her mother, uh, Gulshan Abbas, is held back in Xinjiang um, in one of these camps. In fact, on Christmas Day, I think it was last year, they found out that she'd been sentenced to 20 years uh, in prison. Why? Because Ziba, her daughter here in America, and also her sister, uh, Rushan, who also lives here, have been doing advocacy for the Uyghur people and to try and get their mom out. But even across borders, China is separating families purposefully. They have gone to the State Department and asked the State Department, is there anything you can do to get my mother out? I mean, just right now they're in Geneva advocating for their mother, but they're separated. Her, my, my friend's mother has never met her granddaughter, Sabina. Never. 
She has never been able to give her granddaughter a hug. When you have family torn apart in that way across borders, and then when you have it being done even within the borders, um, and, and I'll go into this a little bit more, we talked about forced sterilization. We didn't talk about forced abortion. We didn't talk about um, infanticide that is happening to the Uyghur people. Radio Free Asia has documented instances where um, women are being injected inside of these camps with unknown substances. And for the women that have survived, they're coming out and they're sterilized. They can't give birth anymore. They're ending future families. And then beyond this, um, you know, even babies that are uh, unborn and babies that are born are being killed because they're Uyghur. This is a systematic attack on the family. And it goes even further. I keep saying it goes further, it goes further, but it, there seems to be no end with the Chinese Communist Party. They're separating children from families, not only by sending Uyghur families to the camps, but by even for those families that are outside of the camps, their children are being removed and put in so-called live-in kindergartens so that they can be indoctrinated by the CCP. They're being taken from their families in this way. And then also through forced labor transfers. Um, there are people who are outside of the camps who are transferred to other regions of China and their children are being left behind. This is systematic. I don't think the Chinese Communist Party is dumb. I think they recognize how unbelievably important the family is. If you can separate a person from place, if you can separate mother from father, husband from wife, children from parents, neighbor from neighbor, if you can undermine trust, you can completely change and subvert an entire society's thinking. And it's happening right before our very eyes. There's so much more, honestly, that I could cover about the Chinese Communist Party and their brutality and the great lengths that they're going to to undermine religion, to undermine the family, to undermine what makes life worth living. I mean, those connections that we have on a personal level, that's what makes life worth living. But I want to, um, you know, turn towards what can be done, some of what has been done at a government level, and then also what we can do as well. Um, I, it's uh, honestly an honor to be able to work on human rights issues um, and to look at it from a conservative perspective, of course, but also to see that there are people in Washington on both sides of the aisle who recognize the severity of the threat that the Chinese Communist Party uh, is, is exacting against the people. And I think there have been a number of things that have been done right. There are a lot of things that have been done wrong, and there's a lot more that needs to be done in order to counter the threat from China. The first um, is the Trump administration really led in issuing sanctions against Chinese Communist Party officials for what they had done. Um, we had advocated at Heritage in particular for the sanctioning of Chen Guangguo. He is the, was the Xinjiang Party secretary who oversaw the creation of the camps, who oversaw a lot of the modern horrors that we're seeing here today. Um, and that was done under the Trump administration. And then now under the Biden administration, shortly after the Trump administration issued their atrocity determination, there were some multilateral sanctions that were issued by the European Union, by the United Kingdom, by Canada, um, and by the US um, to reiterate some of those sanctions that had already been put in place by the US, but also to signal that the world cared and that the Chinese Communist Party officials were not going to get away with what they were doing without the world noticing. There are still a lot of entities and groups that are ripe for sanctioning, and those tools should be used on a multilateral and on a unilateral context in the strongest ways possible. Second, um, we have to tackle the issue of forced labor in Xinjiang. Um, I've mentioned Adrian Zenz a couple of times, but he estimates that uh, roughly 1.6 million Uyghurs are vulnerable to forced labor, and I also mentioned Tibetans. Um, there are an estimated 600,000 that have already been, quote unquote, re-educated and trained in order to be subject to forced labor. Um, the U.S. last year, Congress took leadership and passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. That's supposed to make sure that no goods produced with forced labor make their way into our markets where you and I might be at risk of actually funding um, 
you know, Chinese Communist Party state-owned enterprises that are exploiting the Uyghurs and others in this way. This was an important step. But actually, just this morning, I was, I was testifying um, at a hearing on this particular issue because it's not clear that this is going to be enforced in the ways that it was intended to be. So we have to tackle forced labor in the strongest terms possible because you and I should not be inadvertently funding the Chinese Communist Party through our ordinary purchases on the day to day. The third, um, you know, recommendation, and this is more of a reflection, was it was a powerful move by the Trump administration to issue that atrocity determination on the last day in office. It was necessary, it was a long time coming, and it needed to be done. Now other countries around the globe need to issue atrocity determinations of their own so that some of the follow-on actions we're seeing in the U.S. market happen all across the globe. Because if we don't have similar measures taken, additional sanctions to close loopholes to other markets, um, additional uh, functions of stopping forced labor, those goods are going to find homes in other markets. And so we can't just have the U.S. aware. The U.S. has to lead. That requires diplomacy. That requires one-on-one -on -one action that I think, unfortunately, we're really not seeing at this moment from the Biden administration. Um, the fourth, and, and this builds um, upon, upon some of what I've been talking about, um, is that we, we have to act in a way that recognizes that we might not be able to change the Chinese Communist Party's behavior. We have to take all the steps we possibly can to make it riskier for the CCP to continue with its human rights violations. But in the event that we can't change what the CCP is doing, we have to be able to offer alternatives to Chinese people who are freedom loving and who want to find safe haven beyond their own borders. Um, something I've personally worked on is priority to refugee status, specifically for Uyghurs and for Hong Kongers. Um, we didn't even cover Hong Kong, which I'm happy to talk about in Q&A, but of course Hong Kong is a horrible situation where people literally lost freedom overnight. Um, but those folks also need safe haven, and they can't just find it here in the U.S. We cannot resettle everyone. Um, so we need other countries to step up um, and to provide safe haven to those communities in need as well. Um, my final policy-oriented recommendation, it just reiterates what I was saying, that this action has to be done multilaterally. But in order to have multilateral action, you have to have a strong U.S. And that means strong U.S., not only president, um, of course, you know, we, we hope that there would be a strong president, but um, from Congress, too. Um, and we need to expect more from our members of Congress um, to be able to, to step up and to lead and to encourage countries and parliaments across the globe to step up as well. Because I was recently, and this is a little bit of a detour, but my boss and I were recently in Europe. Um, we are meeting with EU officials, and they have not yet fully woken up to the threat that China poses. But we have to be bold. It is the backbench people in the UK and the EU who care at all about the human rights issues, who care at all about the security concerns, who care at all about the threat. And we need to move this to the front bench. People need to realize that China is the number one threat to the, to the US and to freedom across the globe. And so we need to be leading in bringing partners along with us. OK, finally. I will close with some individual action, because I often get this question working on human rights. I work broadly on human rights, not only on China. I work on Burma. I work on Cambodia. Um, I work on North Korea. So I'm happy to answer questions about those countries um, as well. But people always ask me, what can, I, what can I do? This is so severe. The human rights violations are so bad. Um, is there anything we can possibly do? Um, number one, you can definitely get involved and be educated about what members of Congress are proposing, what the Biden administration is doing, or any future administration is considering on China. Um, and you can make your concerns known. I mean, I know f for members of Congress, like hearing from constituents is the number one reason why they will act. Um, and I think that if they are consistently hearing, we're worried about human rights situation, we're worried about the security concerns emanating from China, they're far more likely to act um, and to make the right decisions. Number two um, is that in this area in particular, I think we're really blessed because there are a lot of people who resettle here, who do advocacy work here, who are refugees here. Um, I think a lot of, I know a lot of my friends were very involved when a lot of the folks from Afghanistan came. 
um, in helping people to get resettled here and to feel like they could have a home. Um, I think being a good neighbor to somebody is probably the most important thing that you can do to alleviate suffering. I mean, you're not able to help somebody who's back home, but somebody who's made it safely here. You can completely change their lives. And I know for me, even though I, I love all of my policy work, the most meaningful parts of my job are getting to know the people who are not merely victims, but survivors of the severe human rights violations that they have faced in their country. And they have taken the blessing of being able to live here and the freedom that they have. And they've said, I'm going to devote my life to advocating for other people. So I think if we can be an encouragement and also offer up the platforms that we have to those folks to be able to speak to their causes for themselves, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And then finally, and this one maybe is a little bit trite, but it's true, there are a lot of amazing organizations out there that are doing great work um, to help advocate for the Chinese people. The first one that comes to my mind is China Aid. It's run by a man named Bob Fu. He has incredible, incredible networks in the underground church, probably unparalleled, truthfully, in China. Um, he has rescued so many people and is incredibly humble about the great lengths that he has gone to in order to make sure that people get to freedom. So I would encourage you to look at China Aid, um, 21 Wilberforce Initiative, which is run by former Congressman Frank Wolf, also does fabulous work in promoting religious freedom generally, but also on China. Um, and there are a lot of smaller groups to, um, that are not necessarily religiously affiliated, like the Uyghur Human Rights Project or Campaign for Uyghurs that do work specifically um, with them. And I'm happy to answer you know, more questions or if you have specific issues in China that you're just wanting to get more involved in, I'm happy to serve as a resource for that. But um, thank you all for having me here today. This has been wonderful. <laughs> Yes. It's uh, such a huge subject, <laughs> such a huge country, so much injustice. It just, just hearing it, it starts to break your heart. Yeah. <laughs> we do have uh, a mic. Do we have a mic? Oh, uh, yes. Jeannie has a mic. If you would, <laughs> if you would just state your que your name and oh. your affiliation, okay. if you have one, and oh, then okay. and I'll That's let great. you call on people. Perfect. Okay. Thank All right. you. I'm Susie Miller, and I'm president of the Republican Women's Club. Uh, in Alexandria, we're called the Commonwealth. I, of course, I've heard so much about what's going on in China. My concern uh, right now is that, well, first I would like to know, are you saying most of the, I can't pronounce it correct, Uyghurs? Were, yeah, Uyghurs. Uyghurs. Yeah. <laughs> are you saying they're mostly in concentration camps at this time? You said 1.8 million. I've heard there's as many as three, three million, million in the country. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not the majority of Uyghurs, but it's a very substantial percentage of Uyghurs. And those that are not inside the camps are often being redistributed. I mean, you could use the language of collectivization. I actually prefer to use that language because it is so closely connected to just communist ideology. But people are sent um, to the tune of millions to elsewhere in China as well. This is what makes the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act so important because that tool is supposed to stop goods not just produced in Xinjiang, but produced through these forced labor transfer programs, which I think everyone will laugh at this. China has rebranded as poverty alleviation programs. And just to be clear, like these people are highly educated individuals, people who are professors, people who worked in tech, people who are very highly educated, who are being repurposed and sent to do menial forms of labor to other parts of the country. It's absolute exploitation. It's absolutely, I mean, we say forced labor. Forced labor is a form of human trafficking. It's trafficking. It's human trafficking. That's what's happening, and it's being done at a state-sponsored level. Um, so I think every person is affected, though, even if you're outside of the camps. Like I didn't cover a lot of the other historic persecution, but they have things like their DNA samples that they're required to give to the government, like iris scans. Um, they have, China writ large has a social credit system, so when you go to get a, book a train ticket or try to fly or leave, you could be stopped because you're, quote unquote, in a suspicious category of person. So even if you're outside of the camps, um, you're still living a life with far lower levels of freedom than, of course, we would like expect here in the U.S. or, or in other free countries. 
how much exactly has Biden done? Yeah, so the Biden administration has a mixed record on this. Um, you know, I think they should be commended for reiterating the atrocity determination and saying we're going to stick by what the Trump administration said. The multilateral sanctions initiatives, obviously, very good. But they were opposed to the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. They tried to not have that be passed. Um, and so it's very much so a mixed bag um, in terms of what they are doing. So I think, you know, the I guess the question is still out to see what they will do with the remainder of their time in office, but it's definitely very much so a mixed bag. Um, I think there's a lot more that should be done, and I think that if the Biden administration isn't willing to take some of these next steps, like extending priority to refugee status or otherwise, and they don't, in fact, enforce the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, because we have to remember that's a possibility. Like, it's an executive branch authority, and so even though Congress has passed it, they might not actually enforce it. We have to hold their feet to the fire. Um, and I think also, and I think this is an important point, I think the Biden administration is of many minds on China, generally, like not just on the human rights issues. Um, part of the reason why they opposed uh, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act was because they have climate change interests that they would like to further. And this often is stymieing other efforts to counter China more generally because they're saying, well, we, we want to cooperate with China on climate change, so maybe we won't be so tough on them um, on a whole range of other issues. So I think, you know, this is when Congress needs to step up and say, no, 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 we're hearing from our constituents, and we're, we're observing all the same things that you are, that even in spite of, you know, Russian, Russia's wrongful invasion of Ukraine, nothing has changed on the extensive threat that China poses to us generally. And we've got to redouble our efforts, arguably, in light of what's happening in Russia in order to counter China. So I think that has to be a priority. And yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what the next couple of years are like. Yeah. Um, well, one, so glad to have you here. Um, yes, so, so glad to have you here and so glad um, that you were able to make it to freedom here. Um, I agree with you. I do think that there is a lot of Chinese money that has convinced a lot of people to look the other direction, and we need to be fully aware of that. Um, I know in the European context, um, so my boss and I, we, we, we traveled um, in the fall to Brussels, London, and Warsaw, and then this spring um, we were in Strasbourg to meet with EU folks again, and then um, in Berlin. And in Berlin in particular, um, I have big questions about whether or not it is the business community driving the lack of response to China or it's the government driving the lack of response to China. And I think, honestly, it's a little bit intertwined, if we're being completely honest. A lot of companies still see opportunities in China, and there may be some economic opportunities in China. Um, but they need to understand that those economic opportunities come with political and security 
consequences. And so I think that we need to be fully aware and businesses need to be made aware that ordinary consumers will spend their dollars elsewhere if we know that they are actively engaging with elements of the Chinese Communist Party that are carrying out human rights violations and posing a security risk. I think there's much more that can be done to tamp down on businesses that are either inadvertently or, frankly speaking, advertently aiding and abetting in what the CCP is doing today. Um, and I think a lot of that, honestly, will have to come from private sector pressure and from all of us who are sitting in here, because we have a choice about where we spend our money. Um, and so I think, I think that's a really important thing to bear in mind. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not an expert in Russia, Russian affairs at all, um, but happy to comment a little bit. Um, number one, I think it is important to bear in mind that China and Russia, although they have some shared goals, have a lot of goals that are not in common. Um, so there may be reasons, you know, that they wouldn't necessarily be simpatico and collaborating in every sense of the word. But they do share one goal unequivocally in common, and that's that they don't want to see a strong U.S., and they want to subvert the U.S. in any way that they can. I think the CCP is looking at the Russian invasion and thinking, huh, how can we shift the balance of power in favor of countries that are authoritarian, like Russia, like China? Um, and so I think it's definitely very concerning um, to see that. And I think we need to monitor very closely the extent to which they are cooperating or not, even not cooperating. I mean, what they're not doing is sometimes, or what countries don't say is sometimes more important than what they do say. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind, too. Um, but as I reiterated um, towards the end of my remarks, I don't think that the threat that China poses has changed at all, um, given the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And I don't think that we should be readjusting resources in a way that um, would weaken our ability to respond to China, even though obviously some resources rightfully need to be diverted to help the Ukrainian people and otherwise. So I think maintaining a focus on the Indo-Pacific and on Asia is going to be incredibly important, not just for the U.S., but to bring alongside other partners who maybe are starting to wake up to the China threat, especially post-COVID. That was one interesting thing I will say, going back to the Europe points, when we were in Europe, um, especially in the U.K., they said after the COVID pandemic, a lot more people, like the citizens of the UK, the citizens of Europe, were a lot more wary of China than they had been before. And that was even compounded in the UK context by Huawei and the 5G debacle. And then even further for UK, of course, which is a much closer ally of the US in, in Europe than any, any other country, um, Hong Kong, because it was personal for UK to have what happened in Hong Kong take place. And of course, they did open up their borders. They have British nationals overseas visas that enable Hong Kongers to be there. And so I think that's going to affect the landscape of the UK and hopefully broader Europe a little bit more, as you do have the voices even from Hong Kong um, being raised and being able to say, you know, we've got to counter China because our freedom was literally like destroyed overnight by the Chinese Communist Party. Becky Cook, a couple things. You'd never mentioned Fulan Gong. Ah, yes. <laughs> and also, um, i wondering as to your take on China becoming so important in Africa, mm. and then China being important to Russia because of they taking over the bases in yeah. Afghanistan mm. and shifting that power, yeah. and they're shifting all the bases that they are now building around yeah. that whole area. Yeah, um, I will try and cover all of those. So first on Falun Gong, I haven't covered Falun Gong a lot in my personal work. I have like sort of in the context of religious freedom and then a little bit on organ trafficking. But I know that Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation just put out in, I think it was an ac academic journal, um, a much more comprehensive study on 
the organ trafficking issue in particular. And again, that hasn't been something I've, co I've covered human trafficking, I've covered religious freedom, but I haven't quite gotten to organ trafficking um, yet. But the organ trafficking problem is affecting Falun Gong. They were kind of the whistleblowers on like, hey, this is happening. Um, for people who don't know, this is basically like prisoners who um, will like, unconsentingly have their organs removed and then sold um, on the black market or to other folks. It's really awful. Um, and so that's allegedly happening to Uyghurs as well. And I think some of the evidence and the attention to the Uyghur issue has made organ trafficking a little bit bigger of a focus um, for some folks. So yeah, something to keep in mind. But organ trafficking is so difficult because it doesn't fit into a neat category because a lot of people say oh is it human trafficking well it's not human trafficking because it's not the whole person it's parts of a person being trafficked yeah it's yeah very complicated but terrible obviously um your remind me your second and third africa yes my colleague josh maservi is fabulous on this he has testified multiple times before congress on china's involvement in africa a lot of the things that he um, has highlighted include how china has um, made investments in africa and essentially um, used that to coercively affect how countries are voting at the united nations um, we also see and this is horrible i covered this in the context um of a, my first paper I ever wrote on the Uyghurs is that um, they use surveillance technology um, all throughout the country, but especially against the Uyghurs in order to monitor behavior. And that surveillance technology is like used to basically identify suspicious behavior. And when I say suspicious behavior, there's a really great Human Rights Watch report that reverse engineered the application that the Chinese uh, Communist Party is using in order to get people um, you know, in order to identify this suspicious behavior. And they, they found that exiting out the back door of your home instead of the front would be like cause for suspicion. Something that innocuous. That's how closely you're being watched. Um, but I say this because China has been exporting their surveillance technology, especially to the more authoritarian governments within Africa. And they say, oh, we're just doing it, you know, to make profit. It's business, blah, blah, blah. But they're actually training them in how to apply these same sort of stringent, onerous, incredibly invasive, um, you know, surveillance tactics. And they say, we're doing it for rule of law. It's good. It's not. It's, it's a complete invasion of privacy. And it is an intrusion of government into, like, every personal aspect of your life. Um, but what was scary was that they um, sent surveillance technology to one African government in particular, trained them in how to use it. And then they exported the personal data of people that they had collected through this surveillance technology to quote unquote refine their technology on darker skinned individuals. Incredibly, incredibly terrifying. Um, but this is what they are doing. And so yeah, China is very involved in Africa. We have um, a project coming out. I think it's later this fall um, that is going to document all of China's investments in Africa um, and even engagements between Chinese government officials and African government officials. And it's going to be a very comprehensive project that is a part of our broader Asian Studies China Transparency Project, um, which looks at basically all the ways that China is not transparent in the security sector and the human rights sector and like a range of different um, issues and it links to publicly available reports detailing this so that people cannot say we didn't know what China was doing. Um, so it's a great resource. Um, you know, I'm happy to send it to anybody who is um, interested in it and then hopefully we'll have that China in Africa report out later. And then you had a question I think about basing to Yeah. Yeah. And not just in Afghanistan, but like Cambodia. Um, it's honestly, truly terrifying. We actually built the base that they took over in Cambodia. Um, so it's a huge security risk. Um, yeah, I think the CCP has been very intentional in their military buildup. I will say I do have a lot of hope in like U.S. deterrence and security capabilities, although it is being undermined by the Biden administration with very low defense spending and the like, um, which is pretty problematic. We also have our military index that um, my other colleagues in foreign policy put out, and they estimate how much we would need in order to ramp up and be able to um, 
basically conduct military uh, operations in a two theater war, that's their standard that they apply. Um, but we're far below that. But I do have a lot of confidence in the Pacific context because we have such strong alliances. I do think that our alliances with Japan, with Korea, with Australia, um, loosely, it's not formal alliance, but with Taiwan, um, they're an incredible partner, and then Thailand and Philippines. We have so many bases and so many like capabilities for um, having an active force posture where there to be some sort of conflict that I do have a lot of confidence, but I think we've got to make sure that we're um, spending the requisite uh, defense money that we need to and modernizing at a rate so that we can keep up with other actors that are posing a, a major threat. Yeah, thank you for all those questions. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I have a lot of questions for you, but we don't have a time. Just the um, very worry about me. I'm sorry, I'm from China. I've been here 11 years, and uh, I suffer in cultural revolution. We both suffer cultural revolution. We know what is the very, very just evil CCP. So we know what he is doing, what he does. And so um, for me, and um, I worry about the uh, American because they involve our vote, president of vote. Before they're just, you know, they're still involved, but they don't care because they, they everything they can handle this, you know, like Bush or the Obama or the Clinton administration. But right now, another Trump way, they just so worry about that. And then they involved, they, you know, still help the Democrats steal this uh, this election, and also you know um, the CIA, FBI, they didn't do anything about the, this election. So I just worry about that. They you know they involved all the West country, even the Australia, Germany, and also the you know the, um, the Taiwan. They put a lot of money in there. It doesn't care about the, the people, Chinese people. They don't care. They never care about their, you know, even you have a tiny the money, but you, even you're hungry. You don't know the CCP just evil. They sense they can't control this country. They kill the people, Chinese people, only the Chinese people. Hundred million, over hundred million people they killed by themselves. Not like a lot of country. The CCP killed the Chinese. Yeah. It's the mostly very bad. That's the evil. I will survive. I must survive because I'm lucky. You know, so I was born in very hungry. I don't have a food. I don't have the I didn't have the food. I don't I didn't have the milk. Yeah. So for me I just worry about it. it involve our election. Mm. That's my question. Yeah, well, I mean yeah, it sounds like you suffered a lot, like going through the Cultural Revolution. And I think, unfortunately, people here in the U.S. are not very well educated on what happened during the Cultural Revolution. I think people do not realize the extent to which um, the Chinese Communist Party, but also communism generally, has taken so many lives. Um, one of my favorite books that I had to read um, at Patrick Henry College, actually, um, is called The Black Book of Communism. And it literally went through um, the history of communism. And it tried to provide conservative estimates on the number of people who have been killed, who have been collectivized, the types of tactics um, that communist regimes use. And that really impressed on me the great dangers of communism, of Marxist-Leninist regimes, and the threat that they pose ideologically and physically in reality. And I think there's a great need to be far more aware of that. I also think that there's a need for the US government to do a lot, to undertake a lot more efforts. This is not my area of expertise. We have great people who cover tech policy. Um, but to be really aware of the disinformation threats that are posed by communist regimes, 
we see the ways in which Chinese um, officials, even on Twitter, um, are, are trying to create and spin up disinformation. Of course, we know Russian dis disinformation is huge. And so we need to be aware of that in election and non-election contexts and be beefing up our efforts to stay on top of the many advancements that a lot of these regimes are making. I mean, I didn't even mention North Korea, too. Of course, you know, the North Koreans are involved in disinformation as well. And so I think there's a, there's a lot of efforts that need to be undertaken to make sure that we're tamping down on that. And also that we're making sure, um, even in like the university context and otherwise, that our um, healthy institutions are not being subverted um, for the Chinese Communist Party's ends. And we have to be very targeted in the ways that we address those challenges. But yeah, thank you for your question. Hey, um, Olivia, thank you so much for your remarks. This has really been sobering, I think, today for, for many of us. Um, I just want to pick up on the last point that you made about universities. So many of the young women that the Claire Booth Luce folks work with are on campus still. They're campus leaders. They, they head up um, campus organizations. What are they seeing on campus um, with regard to what China's presence through Confucius Institutes and yeah, how can they that. be, yeah, how can they be active on the campus and what what kind of hurdles might they face on campus? Yeah, so um, Confucius Institutes are just truly, truly terrible efforts by the Chinese Communist Party to infiltrate the U.S. education system. Not just U.S., it's all across the globe. Um, it's, a, it's a global effort. It's a soft power campaign, absolutely. Um, and, you know, let me be clear. We have no problems with learning about Chinese culture, history. We, everyone should be learning all of those things. But these institutes are there for the purposes of furthering the Chinese Communist Party's ends, period. My colleague Mike Gonzalez has done fabulous work on this, um, looking at specific ways that Confucius Institutes have sought to subvert funding, have tried to infiltrate curriculum, have tried to manipulate historical facts so that they fit the Chinese Communist Party's alternative history. These things have to be ended. So it's been encouraging to see a lot of um, U.S. Um, academic institutions saying, nope, we're not taking Confucius Institute money anymore, but there are still many more that do take the money. And I think also there are a lot of campuses that have campuses inside of China. The number is shrinking, especially post-COVID, um, of those that still have those institutions. But I think that um, it can be very challenging to operate freely and to be critical of the Chinese Communist Party Actually, I will bring up one other example. Um, I'm working on a book project right now that's going to cover the Uyghurs. Um, and I've been interviewing a number of different Uyghur folks. And one of them that I interviewed, her name is um, Rizwan Gul Nur Muhammad, and she's at Cornell. Um, they brought in a Congress member to speak uh, mostly about Russia and Ukraine. But she stood up, you know, just on her own and asked a question about what, what do you think the US Congress should be doing to help the Uyghur people? And um, she wrote, she raised um, the issue of her uh, brother in particular, who is held. All of the Chinese students in the audience stood up in unison and left. They left the Cornell Hall in protest of her asking a Congress member a question. That is so, ah, that's not how things should be on college campuses. Um, and it worries me because I, feel like when I was in college, now I'm feel, I feel old when I was in college back in the day, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, you opened saying that I did debate. And I feel like the freedom of ideas and freedom of expression and the ability to clash with people and still have respect for people despite disagreeing is disintegrating before our very eyes. And it worries me so much because I know that my college experience was incredibly formative to my future career and my thought life. And I worry about the current generation of college students that they won't get that if this is the type of reaction that we have to somebody asking a question. She wasn't even a speaker. So uh, yeah, I think there are a lot of problems and we need to be, we need to be careful. And I guess I'll end on this. We need to be careful that encountering China, we don't become more like China. We cannot allow authoritarianism to influence our own institutions, our own systems in trying to respond. And I think that's a delicate balance to walk, but it's an important one that we have to make sure we achieve. Thank you.
10 more questions for you, but we can talk informally during yes. lunch, okay? Yeah, wonderful. So I want to give you some gifts. Oh, thank it's you. It's a copy of my book. It's in its third printing now. I um, love it. Oh, my gosh. People seem to for like it. For my, like, future oh, perspective there children. There you go. I love it. Definitely. <laughs> and here's our uh, limited edition Claire Blue Blue Center for Conservative Women coffee mug with her oh. famous saying about courage. The ladder on which all the other virtues mount. Isn't that the truth? I love that. And that's something we work on with young women here. I and of course, it. a tote bag. Oh man, to this put is your great. gifts and your groceries in. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. What a great <laughs> talk. Thank you so much. Thank and you. please join us. We have lunch uh, next door. Thank you. <laughs>